And I appreciate everybody uh, joining us today. Um, appreciate you taking some time out of your day to uh, attend our webinar. Um, right before we get started, we like to go over um, just a little disclaimer statement, uh, just to, to state that, you know, as of the moment that we uh, put this together, uh, everything was accurate, but uh, things changed so rapidly that we always like to just um, encourage you that if there's something that um, you have questions about, please reach out to us. Um, and you can always use our slide deck that we're going to send to you um, to reference materials, but you always need to look at the guidelines specifically for yourself um, as you think necessary. So our agenda today includes gaining insight into how your audits compare uh, with us as an external reviewer with your internal processes. And our goal is to help you to determine future review areas of interest based on our previous and current findings and to decide how to prioritize areas of concern for specific MSDRGs, uh, procedures, services, or diagnoses. Um, and additionally, to identify trends and possible areas of concern that you may not have been aware of prior to our presentation or just to verify that you're seeing similar outcomes. And this slide just shows the sections that we're gonna go over today with um, understanding what inpatient audits are. Uh, I always do a little include at the beginning of our webinars so that it, depending on whoever attends, they can fully get a little bit of the backstory, uh, understand more, especially if they're new in to coding or CDI, um, or even if we have a physician on a call who uh, is interested in learning more so that everybody gets that well-rounded background uh, knowledge. And so we're going to get started. Um, let's go over a brief section about auditing. As I mentioned, um, there's many different avenues for auditing in patient cases. In this slide, we're looking at inpatient auditing at a very high level overview. One of the most common types of audits is an external reviewer-based audit in which uh, an auditor is not associated with the facility or the provider, and they're just reviewing the records for discrepancy. And they can either be hired by the facility to do this or by um, a, a payer to review the claims. External and internal auditors may perform a DRG-focused review where they look specifically at the MS or APR DRG that was reported and validate if this was the most appropriate DRG to report based on the documentation and then confirming that all MCCs and CCs were reported. Uh, during a re DRG review, we also check, for, check the operative reports uh, and confirm that the right PCS codes were reported that have effect on the DRG. Um, and for quality reporting and statistics. There may also be those quality-based reviews performed in which the documentation is reviewed for the continuity of care, where we check for ambiguity in diagnosis and validate the clinical criteria that's being met, along with the patient's length of stay, their discharge disposition, and any follow-up uh, post-discharge care. Internally, a facility will perform also code or coder-based reviews, and the sole purpose of these audits is to just gauge whether a coder is accurately assigning their codes, and if not, then do they need to be put on a PIP, a performance plan, um, or if they need additional education moving forward on a certain area. So when starting an external or internal audit, the various type of audit being performed will depend on what needs a facility may have uh, and who's performing the review, whether it's the coding supervisor, the CFO, compliance officer, um, if it's an external review by a payer. And so we're, we'll go over here shortly more detailed examples of um, some, some cases that we've looked at in the past and also how we choose our claim selection as an external reviewer. Um, and so, you know, when you're deciding to do the audit, you need to realize what your focus is gonna be on or what the need base is. And if you're gonna do a focused or a random review, and again, that whether it's internal or external, um, and if it's concurrent or retrospective, meaning if it's while the patient's in-house, there's audits being performed 
and or if it's post payment retrospectively. And who you're going to present these findings to will also uh, need to be determined in how you pull together the information. And I've, I've placed out here the uh, little blip for the PEVA report. Facilities use that for um, checking those top 10 DRGs at their facility with an equivalent facility to see if there's any outliers between them. And if there is, then they would pull those out specifically to look at those DRGs. So as an external reviewer, we partner up with each facility to augment what they currently have going on with those internal audits. And we can help facilities by looking at claims with their own specific criteria, such as certain specialists or specialties that may have just come on board where the coding staff may be uncertain as to how appropriate their code assignments are, and they just need an external reviewer to give them some feedback. Or we can use our own proprietary DRG selection as a basis for claim selection. And we generally, as an external reviewer, look solely at retrospective reviews, but there, there is those opportunities where facilities will hire you on for concurrent reviews, uh, trying to solidify those DRGs before they go out um, for billing. And the basis of these external reviews, well, for us specifically, um, we like to look at the whole gamut. You know, we try to look at the discharge disposition, the present on admission indicators, severity of illness, risk of mortality scores. We look at uh, the full clinical picture for the CCs and MCCs as uh, well as the principal diagnosis selection and any readmission issues with diagnosis such as congestive heart failure or MIs, uh, pneumonia. And by doing that, we feel like it's a really well-rounded audit that can encompass several areas of reimbursement and quality-based uh, areas. Auditors also like to review queries to ensure that they're not leading their um, or that they're not missing altogether and that they're just clinically relevant to the case. And some facilities don't incorporate their queries into the EMR. And uh, we've been told that this is due to them feeling that it may be considered a liability if something goes to litigation. But um, others feel that, you know, the ability for an auditor to see and utilize previous queries in their reviews is a better gauge of how well they're actually doing. And um, for me, as an external reviewer, my opinion is that seeing those queries can um, help me in making the most appropriate recommendations uh, and understanding if the queries are being um, performed timely, if they're appropriately written, if they're clinically valid or relevant, and um, just knowing that the opportunities haven't been missed with doing a, a query either. And it just helps us to be um, more reliable and useful to the facilities when we're giving our feedback. And that way it's not just such a blind review. But I can see both sides of that. Um, but again, I think that uh, a facility might get better feedback um, and know about areas of being non-compliant possibly if those queries were attached in the EMR in a way that could be reviewed. Most facilities have an internal team of concurrent reviewers that can range from coding staff to the, the CDI team. And during these concurrent reviews, the goal is to clarify ambiguous documentation from the providers and to gain agreement between coding and CDI on what the principal diagnosis may be. So to go from that working DRG to uh, the final. And this just ensures that there is a very accurate and clear clinical picture and that there's no concerns for areas to argue later um, that could result in a denial. Another great area to look at for auditing is your denials, as we just mentioned. This helps with determining additional areas of concern uh, that you may want to work on for preventing future denials. In this slide, we included some MSDRGs that we noticed insurance companies focused on in 2020 that related to uh, CC or MCC for how that DRG's payment is, um, is placed. As you can see, each MSDRG is affected by the inclusion of a CC or MCC. And we even see instances where a claim may have several CCs 
in only one C, one MCC, and they'll target that MCC because of the effect on the payment. And this slide is a continuation of that previous one. Um, however, here we show some um, more common DRGs that aren't necessarily based on that CC or MCC inclusion and could be more about the principal diagnosis selection or both the principal and procedure uh, selection. So here I've added some of my office humor, <laughs> um, trying to lighten it up a little bit. But some of the denial rationale that you will see, and I keep mentioning denials because um, a lot of times that's where um, you know, an auditor is going to focus. But a lot of what you will see won't be a surprise um, and will include areas that a reviewer would already look at anyway um, with that one CC or MCC. And this is common with payers and facilities know to look at this. Uh, an example would be, you know, congestive heart failure and reporting pleural effusion. They're gonna target that. Or in the case of one MCC with multiple CCs, an example might be a case where they're trying to validate the clinical significance of acute respiratory failure or even pneumonia, and um, they're trying to disprove aspiration over um, regular pneumonia. Uh, procedures are another area we have seen a lot of denials in the past with bronchos uh, bronchoscopies and whether they were diagnostic versus therapeutic and that character usage within the PCS procedure code. We've seen issues with sequencing for the principal diagnosis, such as pulmonary embolisms um, and hemorrhagic disorders versus a bleed or blood loss anemia as principal. And sepsis uh, has been an issue for clinical validity for probably going on two years now. Uh, but earlier last year, we've seen an issue with um, sepsis as a secondary diagnosis and a POA of yes. Um, and that is gonna be a target internally and externally, um, but well, primarily internally, um, you know, sepsis as, as a secondary with a POA of yes, it would not happen. It would, um, because of sequencing recommendations would be a principal diagnosis if it was uh, present on admission in general. A few other areas of concern, MSDRG 673, We've seen it picked for review of clinical significance with acute renal failure. Um, and then those MSDRGs for 980s, always um, facilities should look at these prior to billing. Uh, no claim in that section should ever go out the, out the door being billed without being reviewed previously. Uh, we see a lot of instances where there's just a discrepancy either with the principal diagnosis or within the procedure code itself. There are those instances where it, it is appropriate to report, especially if they came in for one thing and something else overarchingly took over in the care. So as you can see in the previous slides for denials um, that we mentioned, those scenarios show one reason for auditing. Uh, in order to ensure that payment is accurate and appropriate, uh, facilities also perform audits uh, for other methods to improve quality of care for their patients and to ensure safe outcomes of care. And just to, to ensure that their quality is, is reported properly. Another reason for audits is to ensure the accuracy of the coding staff. Uh, some audits are used to rate employees for performance appraisals and regular internal and external audits help facilities to be overall healthy and compliant their revenue, patient safety, uh, and patient satisfaction. And I also made note, now this is a little bit older now, uh, but a few years ago, um, Change Healthcare made a statement from some of their reviews that for the typical health system, as much as 3.3% of their net patient revenue, on average, almost 5 million per hospital was put at risk due to denials. So it, it just puts, um, an emphasis on that financial relevance of how much is at stake for facilities when performing their audits and handling their denials. 
And of course, auditing is important for staying compliant with Medicare and Medicaid, as well as per commercial payers. And just to make note as well, um, the Medicare Managed Care Manual and Medicare Advantage Plan notes that routine monitoring and auditing is recommended. Proactive auditing by facilities can ensure that upcoding or inappropriate charges are not happening and it strengthens their program's integrity and also ensures that facilities and providers are not penalized for improper payments or receiving limited access to their government programs. An example of an audit that facilities will face with Medicare and Medicare Advantage organizations um, in this year will involve COVID reporting on inpatient claims with the use of the U07.1 for COVID-19. And this will result in a 20% increase in their MSDRG payment. So they're, they're definitely going to take a look at those claims. And um, as of September 1st, they are requiring a positive COVID viral test be on file and that it had been performed within 14 days of admission and on the record. And they do note that there is some extenuating circumstances where they'll let that ride, but they are gonna perform audits on these. Um, so you're gonna want to make sure that your facility is monitoring that. And so with these, this will be a post-payment audit and they're gonna try to recoup that additional 20%. And if your facility is struggling with this um, and you want to avoid, say that you do have a patient who their test was maybe 30 days prior to admission, they're still having some respiratory um, symptoms, but it's nothing severe enough. They're not in isolation anymore. They're, um, they're, they're not having remdesivir or convalescent plasma being administered. Uh, there's really no treatment. It's just a notation in the chart. It's up to the facility whether they, how they go about recording that. Um, if it's clinically significant, you can report it. Uh, if you want to see how that pans out with payment um, and a post bill or a post payment audit, you, you can determine that. Or you can add um, an NTE02 notation to your institutional bill that notes that there was no positive test on file and that you're waiving that additional 20% so that you don't get penalized later. Additionally, CMS is offering uh, above the 20% more add-on payments uh, due to their um, new treatments add-on payment um, program in CTAP for uh, these inpatient claims. And that's gonna be based on whether the patient has received those administration of the medicines, such as what I mentioned with remdesivir or the um, convalescent plasma. So, you know, COVID does bring some new things to the picture for review with auditing this year. Um, but we just wanted to add those, those brief items there. I'm sure we're probably gonna see uh, things as uh, COVID expands, um, we might see other areas of concern. And some more of my humor. Um, so who are the key players that can be affected by audits? Uh, these can include everyone from the patient clear up to the CFO and include government programs and payers. And so we've listed some of those here. So now let's move on to some challenges that coders face and some examples of these reviews. Coders, like everyone else in the hospital setting, are under a microscope and are expected to work tirelessly with production standards that don't match quality and accuracy standards or rates. And coders have to complete claims timely while ensuring appropriate code assignment, DOG assignment, that they're meeting those productivity standards. And they may actually uh, need to walk away and do some education with the physicians. Um, they have to work closely with CDI and their accounts receivable department. All of this while keeping up with um, guidelines as they're constantly changing. And uh, let's not forget possibly uh, responding to external auditors or to a denial with uh, a rebuttal. 
Great. So in our next few slides, we're going to look at a few examples where issues may have been found, and we assume that these issues could be due to a variety of things such as heavy workloads, um, you know, backlog that they're working through, maybe they're um, on overtime. It could also be that they're new to coding for that specialty or just new to coding in general. So in this first scenario, we'll look at how a procedure with the wrong body part character can affect reimbursement here we have a patient with a nosebleed that has failed nasal packing and is bleeding through the gauze. They admit and choose to perform an embosphere particle embolization and successfully occlude the maxillary artery that is located within the right external carotid section in PCS. So, you know, the coder is thinking that they're going to be able to go into PCS and find maxillary artery, but they don't see that, they have to actually go in to use the body part character right external carotid. Um, so um, in this scenario, the, the coder goes in, they, they might have gotten interrupted in their day's work. They may have responded to a phone call or an email and they've read maxillary, 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 but what they're seeing when they go into PCS is mammary. Um, and their brain just automatically clicks mammary if they're in, um, uh, you know, their, their 3M encoder online, or even if they're using their book. Um, and so they select that instead of um, the internal maxillary arteries. And so by, by doing that, this scenario, we pulled this claim initially because it was a 981. And through um, you know, looking at the procedure code and uh, drilling down on it, we found that um, it actually needed to go into MSDRG 143 and that this was an $11,000 decrease due to that, um, that missed body part character. So just one digit in the entire um, seven digit PCS code affected that whole reimbursement for that claim. And, you know, a coder opens this up and, and you know, this claim and it's just a nosebleed. You don't think that um, it's going to have that kind of an impact. Here we have another example. Uh, we see how a procedure code with selection of the diagnostic versus therapeutic character can affect reimbursement. And again, you know, productivity uh, can make this difficult, uh, especially if the documentation is a bit ambiguous. Um, and we have a scenario later in the slides where you'll see if it, depending on if it's a, a, a smidge of a sample in a biopsy, you know, that would be diagnostic versus an entire section of something being removed for a therapeutic use can affect the payment. So in this example, uh, we have a bronchoscopy. Um, and we've seen in the past with previous versions of the grouper that these are an issue and that payers like to focus on these. And if in these, if you do not select the proper um, character for therapeutic versus diagnostic, it can have um, a negative $4,000 impact on general. So bronchoscopies are another area of concern. And here we have a scenario that started out being reviewed for, the, again, MSDRG 981. And then as we worked through it, we seen that it had another issue with it um, and we didn't just stop. Uh, so with, with where we thought it went initially, but the patient presents for osteomyelitis of the fifth metatarsal. It's gangrene ulcerated and they have peripheral neuropathy on top of their, um, their diabetes. And so the procedure performed notes that they had a, they removed the fifth metatarsal base. And this is consistent with the specimen sample in the pathology, noting that it was the remaining fifth metatarsal base. So it's always nice to correlate those two together. So initially the code selection was E1152 for diabetes with peripheral angiopathy and gangrene. And the principal procedure reported was excision of left toe flanks. Um, and with that combination, it led us to MSDRG 981. And so uh, 
we realized that there was an issue with the procedure body part character that it needed to not be phalanx and that it needed to be metatarsal. And that pushed it into MSDRG 987 and started us off with around an $8,000 decrease. And then um, we realized, well, this patient had osteomyelitis. They had to remove it to save the rest of the toe. So then we realized that the principal diagnosis didn't quite mesh with everything that was going on. So we recommended to change that E1152 to E1169 for diabetes with other complications to um, account for the osteomyelitis. And by doing that, it took it again, you know, from a 987. So we were at 981, now we're at 987. And with this change, it brought the MSDRG to the more appropriate 628. And it decreased still, um, but not as bad as the 8,000, it decreased it to 6,000 for that one. So as you can see, we didn't stop once we got out of 981 and we got to 987, we still drilled down to make sure that everything meshed properly between that principal diagnosis and the procedure, the reason for coming in and the overarching uh, treatment. So we have a few more examples for, uh, for this coder section, um, but there, um, these were some really good examples that we had from early 2020 and late 2019 that, that had such good insight that we wanted to include them again in this year's webinar. And so here we have an example, patient is found to have an atrial myoma, and so they need to have it excised or resected. So initially, this was reported with excision of left atrium open approach diagnostic. Um, documentation on the procedure report notes that they removed everything. They were very adamant that there's no residuals, they got rid of everything, and that they performed a left uh, atriotomy. Um, so we suggested to revise this from um, that... Uh, excision of left atrium to and not being a um, diagnostic but to a therapeutic and by doing so that took it out of that 981 DRG and took it to a 228 and um, the thought process behind this was that that had to be completely removed in order for the the heart to work properly and you know, usually facilities think that 980s are going to get them optimal payment because these are outliers, um, but not always. Uh, here we have a scenario where by doing so, this almost created a $16,000 increase and it was appropriate. So, um, you know, it's crucial to look at those 980s. Um, I know some, some facilities might get a little backlash because, um, hey, that's where it went. It's more payment in general, but it's more work on the back end because they're going to get denied. They're going to get reworked. They're, the payment's going to be adjusted, um, and you should probably put the, the work in in advance um, prior to billing. All right, here we have a patient with a history of chronic respiratory failure with ventilation dependence on um, tracheostomy, and they're admitted due to pneumonia. So in this scenario, the patient is using their own equipment in the hospital. Um, and so this isn't, uh, for this facility, wasn't very common. Um, and so they did not end up reporting the ventilation uh, procedure code. And um, by adding that on, it increased the, the reimbursement by about 4,500. And even their severity of illness went up as well. And um, we were able to, there's a coding clinic on this um, that let the facility know that this can definitely be reported. It doesn't matter who owns the equipment, but there's resources being utilized while the patient is in the hospital and they're on vent that, um, you know, those resources need to be accounted for. All right, and here we have um, a scenario with a patient with angioedema they're in acute respiratory failure and in need of an emergency ventilation in the ER prior to admit. So especially if this is a smaller hospital where patients don't normally go for those emergent needs, 
um, a coder is not going to be used to seeing uh, a cricothyroidotomy be, um, being listed and mentioned in the ED record. And so, um, you know, this is a bedside procedure. You don't think it's very um, intense or that it, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. But um, initially, this was um, coded as an excision. And after we got to looking at it and looking at the PCS guidelines, we felt that it met more of the bypass uh, root operation. And so we sent this out to Coding Clinic. We wanted to get uh, to AHA to get some clarification. Uh, we went ahead and told the client what our thoughts was. Um, and a few months later, we got a response uh, but we pulled this for a 981 again. Um, these ones are just usually such really good examples. And by adding that bypass on from the trachea to the, to the cutaneous, it took it to DRG4 and it increased the payment by almost $50,000. So this is a rarity, um, but it is a really good example, um, especially for a facility or a coder that is not used to seeing this type of procedure performed. And so just to give you some further insight to, into that scenario, um, here's a redacted example of the procedural note uh, with notation of that uh, cricothyroidotomy tube placement, just so that you have it for a reference in the future. And um, here's our response for, that we received from um, coding clinic. And I'm not sure if this one has been published. Uh, I'd have to look, but we keep track of our internal guidance that we receive. And this is just a slide to show you how that procedure is performed. And um, just so that you can see, especially to the far right there, how it is a bypass of the trachea, the windpipe going out to um, the cutaneous. And so to finish up this section for coding challenges, I'd like to mention that while all these scenarios mostly dealt with procedural selection and a lot of 980s, there is always issues with missing a CC or MCC and in principal diagnosis selection and sequencing. Um, and, but we'll look next at documentation, which affects coding too. Um, but it's primarily when we get into the documentation, we're really talking more physician and CDI team but coders can help in this area as well um, by sending clarifications or working closely with uh, the CDI and physicians. So as we mentioned in our previous section for coding, um, the clinicians and CDI staff have very similar struggles. They're managing their time, queries, monitoring um, you know, their unanswered queries, reviewing documentation, um, you know, working through payer issues, getting their education, and writing rebuttals uh, or helping with rebuttals. And, and a huge key to the success for facilities includes that whole team, coders, CDI, clinicians. Um, but ultimately a lot comes back to those physicians. And that's very unfortunate because they have so much on their plate, it leads to physician burnout. Um, and a lot of facilities, a majority of facilities are using physician liaisons and champions to help out with that and to um, also help the CDI and the coders get the answers that they need, um, get those queries responded to and denials. And another issue that we see a lot of is, you know, a, a physician, they really struggle with, they, they have a CDI team that might be telling them one thing, a coder might be telling them something else, then they're seeing the denial from the payer and they don't really, you know, they're danged if they do, I guess, and they're danged if they don't, um, by you report it or you don't report it, which uh, clinical criteria are we gonna go by? So everybody really needs to work together, but um, for educational purposes, you really um, one team and a team approach is best so that the physicians don't have all of that uh, confusion and contrasting information being given. So moving on to examples for trouble areas for physicians and CDI. Um, 
So this chart was pulled for review with respiratory failure, and it was the only MCC on the claim, and it was reviewed pre-bill, which was great. Um, but this is also a good example that you're going to see as a post-bill denial. Um, so here the, we have a patient with severe COPD. They're on supplemental oxygen, and the patient presents to the emergency department with a chief complaint of right-sided chest pain and cough. So acute and chronic respiratory failure with hypoxia is coded as a secondary diagnosis. And, um, you know, because it's that only MCC, it's trying, the payer's trying to remove it to reduce that payment. And by doing that, it's gonna take it from DRG 177 and take it to 178 for about a $4,500 decrease. So the clinical picture, um, on the HMP documentation, the patient's admitted, ad, admitted for chronic shortness of breath requiring two liters of oxygen via nasal cannula throughout the day and four liters uh, at night. Physical exam, their respiratory rate is 16, their oxygen saturation is 95, and their respiratory bilateral, um, they have crackles and wheezing, but they're stable on the two liters. So um, the documentation on this is uh, a little weak for validation, for validation um, because they have... Um, chronic hypoxic respiratory failure. And um, in general, with that, um, you know, a, a patient can't usually be put on home oxygen until their SATs are at 91%. And so they put them on that oxygen to bring them up above to 92% or higher. So you, this patient, um, they're satting at 95%. They're they're not needing additional their oxygen. They're stable on what they have. Um, but this really, you know, when it gets to the coder, it's almost too late. This is something that needed to be clarified while the patient was in the hospital with CDI um, to see if, if they really do have the acute portion of this. And so just as a reminder that this scenario was not necessarily a coding issue per se, because, you know, coders are allowed to report diagnosis based on the physician's uh, diagnostic statement. And that's become a, a point of con contention between everybody. Um, so that's it, a question was submitted to a coding clinic in regards to this, that um, you know, some people are interpreting that um, there doesn't have to be clinical documentation to support a code that just as long as the doctor says it's okay. Well, that's not necessarily how that's to be interpreted. It was to be interpreted that um, a coder can still code it, but uh, the, the clinical picture still does need to support what the doctor is saying. Um, so we do still need to send clarifications. And I know coders can sometimes feel um, inadequate to send those, but you know I think it just takes getting um, used to um, reviewing things um, and looking at the clinical picture more, and that it is the responsibility of coding to be familiar with that, whether it's through uh, working with CDI and getting educated through them. Um, working with your providers or working on your own to get more education or going off and getting that education anywhere it's uh, available. Um, because again, it's that whole team approach. CDI can't catch everything. Um, physicians are, are very busy and you've got multiple physicians on a chart. So if a coder can catch something um, and they see it enough, then they can really clue in the CDI staff to, hey, maybe we have an issue here and maybe we could start pulling a few more claims in this area for those concurrent reviews by the CDI staff. So additionally from that previous scenario, when validating a diagnosis, you can always use the additional diagnosis rule for argument in determining when to report a diagnosis as well. And so what we see a lot of times is payers will deny like five CCs on a claim 
They won't say specifically what's wrong with each of them. They'll just list the section three reporting additional diagnoses um, rule and say that that's why. They'll say, well, there was, it wasn't clinically evaluated or it didn't really have any treatment, but they don't, I, they're not reading it properly to understand that these are all or statements, they're not and. So um, that is something that if you do, would happen to get a denial and a payer is using this as their argument, we need to just remind them that these are or statements and um, that that's not all encompassing. And an example that we've had recently was um, we had a payer deny a patient's UTI diagnosis. They said that um, it hadn't been evaluated because they didn't do um, a urine culture. Well, in that scenario, this patient came in um, after being treated for a UTI and they still had three days left of antibiotics to be treated, but they came in for another condition. The pharmacy had to dispense the uh, antibiotics so that the patient would finish out their treatment, but they did not do um, a urine culture because if they had, since the patient was previously on the antibiotics, it um, would have been no good for um, bringing back a positive. So um, the, the payer is way off on that by stating this section three guideline for additional diagnosis is because it was uh, treated therapeutically. They may not have had to evaluate it, but they did still have to treat it. So here we have another scenario in which we look at the clinical validation of sepsis in a one day stay with the patient being sent home. It is a huge red flag for external reviewers when looking at sepsis as being clinically valid when the patient is discharged within one and I'll even go to as far as to say four days and then sent home instead of being transferred. So um, coders should use their professional judgment in cases like this to work with CDI and the physician to clarify the clinical picture of the patient. And this can be difficult when questioning the provider, but more often these cases will be reviewed eventually through a denial. So we might as well be proactive um, and work with them ahead of time. And this can be hard for the doctors because um, they might be being pushed to say sepsis um, when just two or three uh, symptoms are uh, present, such as a fever or tachycardia or elevated white blood count, which can all be indicative of an infection, not necessarily uh, sepsis. So in another difficult area for this is a lot of times you'll see sepsis mentioned in the emergency room record because um, they're including it in their, um, you know, what they're trying to rule out. And it might make it to the HMP, but then it never makes it anywhere else on the record. And um, it's trying to be pulled into the claim without being clarified or a query sent. Or I've even seen where it, you know, it, it's only on the discharge summary and it kind of appeared from anywhere. And it says, oh, addendum, patient with sepsis and it was present day of admission. That looks very suspicious when you're an external auditor um, and the patient has maybe uh, pneumonia or UTI. All right, so here we have another, so this is, um, we're still going through for um, sepsis. So this is the clinical picture, normal white blood count, no fever, lactic acid is elevated, elevated total bile, um, elevated albumin, elevated ALT, and elevated um, glanulocyte. So um, sepsis is not listed on the final discharge summary notation, and it's only in the ED and HMP. Progress notes and discharge summary state chest pain likely related to GI symptoms with the, tro the troponin and telemetry negative and to continue them on uh, the PPI. Um, most payers are denying instances in which the clinical picture could support other um, comorbid conditions other than the sepsis, such as alcoholic dependence where there's liver enzymes are elevated and lactic acid levels are elevated um, and could be the possible indication in this patient. 
um, payer uh, may suggest the principal diagnosis of sepsis be removed and replaced with either, um, in this case, it could have been cellulitis or the gastritis. Um, and I we determined to go with uh, the gastritis. Um, and it, it appeared to us and to probably the payer that the sepsis was ruled out. And here we have a chart where there's only one CC on the claim in a case of sepsis as principal. And we are questioning the validity of sepsis, which would end up taking away um, the CC. And so this patient had, was noted to have sepsis throughout the chart with ureteral stone and hydronephrosis. And the sepsis criteria may be questioned with the patient only having um, a low-grade fever, a white blood count of 18,000, but then their lactic acid was not elevated. So, you know, the coder could um, report the sepsis. It's, it's been documented by the provider, but the payer is probably going to deny this and state that this is just a local infection with the UTI. Um, so sepsis, it's the big hitter for us this last year and the year before, and I think it's going to continue on. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of work between um, facilities figuring out exactly how to um, audit these, report these, and working with their payers to make sure that their contracts reflect appropriately what is expected, especially um, the more and more I've read sepsis three, you know, we've all know that it's for ICU patients. Um, outside of the ICU, it's, it's more of just a suggestion. Um, and if you even read into it further, it has not been clinically validated. It's solely a suggestion um, and that you can't only just use the QSOFA, you have to use the whole SOFA scale or score to really reflect patients. But ultimately we want the providers, if they, they think there's possible sepsis, that they treat them that way. And so this is our last example of documentation issues for physicians in CDI. Um, this chart was pulled for review of respiratory failure as the only MCC on the claim. Uh, patients admitted status post total abdominal hysterectomy. Um, by removing that acute on chronic respiratory failure with hypoxia, it moves it from 742 to 743 with um, a little over $4,000 decrease. And again, this is another one where we have that um, their SAT is at 92. Um, they have their on chronic uh, home O2 use and it, they're in for shortness of breath, stage three. And um, I, it just, they were prescribed their normal amount of oxygen. I think it's going, it, it would be one where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they're not really showing a major decrease in, uh, in either their saturation or elevation with their O2 needs. Before we finish up the clinician section, uh, we wanted to include a slide that shows those areas that continue to impact denials with clinical validation. So there's not been a lot of change from 2019, and I don't see there going to be a lot of huge changes in 2021. Um, the definite issues seen related to clinical validation, uh, acute respiratory failure encephalopathy, whether it's toxic or metabolic, and of course, sepsis. Uh, we have seen that malnutrition and acute renal failure has gotten better, especially with renal failure and notation of a baseline. So speaking more on sepsis, uh, we wanted to briefly give you a quick notation of trouble areas for sepsis that we're seeing. So, you know, being having sepsis noted in the ED and not carried forward, was it ruled out? Sepsis syndrome being said, um, that is not an acceptable diagnosis for coding purposes. Um, 
urosepsis still being said when it, it basically is meaning UTI. Um, Sears with infection has popped up numerous times recently. I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it's just that disconnect between being a clinician and being a coder. Uh, I think it's going to take educating the providers that that equals local infection and not systemic infection for you. Um, that if it's truly, they feel that it is sears with infection or due to infection or sepsis due to an infection that they need to state sepsis and relate it to the infection and look for an organ failure. So as you can see, uh, preventative audits as a pre-bill for areas of concern will definitely help keep you from getting into the denials circle. Um, but it really needs to be everybody on board and it's all about that documentation. So your audits can help you with those denials. They can help you with the documentation. They can help you work as a team together to see everybody's side of how um, the tasks are divided and but it all comes together at the end. So we're gonna wrap up. I did wanna show some slides with some stats on them. Here we did a comparison of our results from 2019 and from 2020, 2020 um, and where our biggest shifts and errors were. And the coding issues went down a bit from 63% to 57, which coding is generally your highest area anyway. But um, it was surprising to see that documentation issues went up from 26 to 32%. And I, I assume that this is due to the sepsis and the respiratory failure issues that we're seeing. Um, and next, uh, we have the combination for issues at 11%. And that relates to all areas of errors with uh, documentation and coding on claims. And that can be for multiple reasons. Uh, one claim might have an issue with principal diagnosis selection to validation of sepsis or missing documentation that was needed for the procedure to be coded properly. And this, this comparison that we have here, it might not be indicative of your facility. A lot goes into our audit selections from um, using our own proprietary uh, DRG selections or um, certain diagnoses that we target that um, we feel we've seen um, issues with in the past, but facilities also request specific reviews such as, um, you know, they may have a certain physician that came on board that's doing vascular procedures that they've not seen before. The coders want to feel more, um, uh, yeah, assured that they're selecting the appropriate codes. Uh, so depending on how an audit is selected, what claims we review really affects these statistics. So it's not um, apples to apples. Um, there is a little bit of skewing in the data, but overall, I think you would, facilities would probably agree that coding is the biggest area where there can be um, variances and then followed by um, the documentation. So if we look solely at 2020, this gives us a nice overview of where our findings were for this 12 month of statistics um, out of those claims that shifted. 57% of those were due to coding. Um, and this could be, like I said, a POA selection. It could be a missed query, procedural code assignment, um, inappropriate CC or MCC reported or not reported. And then for the documentation, um, this could be unanswered queries or clarifications. Um, and that was at 32%. And that could even be missed queries not being sent. Um, and then again, that combined area of 11%. And I'm not sure, it will depend on your screen size and resolution if you can see this very well, but we do have another slide that, that lists it out specifically. So here you can see at first glance, the top MSDRG that had the issues for this year was sepsis. I think it would be a surprise to see anything different than that. Um, but this comparison just shows how 
heavily sepsis has been hit compared to the other MSDRGs that we've seen shifts or um, issues with. And that sepsis, again, that's, that's based on payers um, trying to force facilities to use sepsis three criteria instead of sepsis two. Um, go to, so this, this is that slide I was mentioning that we just list out the DRGs. And again, you know, 980 is most common. Um, definitely facilities should not let any of those go out the door unless they've looked at them. Um, we've noticed that for the 981 to 82, these are usually negative in shift and can range around about 7,000 um, a claim. And generally the issue is just resequencing. The, it's just sequencing the wrong as principal. And then again, with the sepsis, the 871s, 872s um, are probably the facility's biggest hit. And on, in general, just one of those usually shifts by a negative 6,000. So if you're a smaller facility, and let's say that you have five cases a month that a, a payer is denying, and um, that could lead to $120,000 in um, weak revenue that was expected and now is being taken back just in one quarter. Um, and, you know, facilities are definitely aware of this, but they just may not know how impactful this is. And this is where CDI really needs to know what's being denied. If the denials are coming to the coding department and the coders are taking care of it themselves and they're working hard because it's a small facility, they don't have a phys physician liaison, they don't have a physician champion, um, they don't have a good relationship with CDI, CDI could be pushing sepsis to show how um, uh, impactful their job is and how much more reimbursement they're bringing in. But the amount of reimbursement that's being lost in reworking these claims in um, the coders not being able to code the claim or code claims because they're working on denials, it, it's just getting um, eaten up on that back end, what is initially being thought that it's coming in at the beginning. So, um, you know, those relationships need to be built. Um, CDI needs to see those denials and the physicians need to see them too. It's gotta go straight up to the source of the documentation for it to ever get any better. Uh, so we appreciate you taking time out of your day and spending it with us. Uh, this slide finishes up our presentation. We hope that you found the content helpful to your role. And as always, we enjoy this opportunity to present our findings to you. Um, the next few slides just include our resources. And again, um, we didn't accept any Q&A live, uh, but if you wanted to send those in the chat, we'll get those back out to you within 10 business days. And then I believe uh, later today you will get um, your uh, CEU certificates, and I'm not sure, maybe the slides and then the Q&A would come later. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, we had a, a few questions about that always. I just want to reassure everybody that we will send a follow-up email that will have um, a link to your CEU certificates, as well as you can download the slides and you can rewatch the presentation or send along to your colleagues if they want to watch it or something like that. There's obviously a lot of great information in here for that. Um, just a quick tip too. I mean, if, if you ever want to look at this or prior webinars, if you go back to vitalware.com slash webinars, our webinars page under resources, we do host all the slides and on-demand recordings there. So you can rewatch or download there. And that's where these slides will be as well. If you have trouble finding them, we have live chat on our website as well. So just ping that live chat person and we'll make sure to lead you in the right direction. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending today. And uh, we have another web webinar next week. So check that out. And hopefully we will talk to you soon. Have a great day, everybody.